with regressive hypnotherapy. Over and over again, we get these hidden consistencies in uh, abduction reports which come out through hypnosis. These individuals report this experience uh, as real. But it is not dream, it is not fantasy, it is uh, not delusion. Abductee accounts revealed under hypnosis are shocking in their consistency. And this is when I saw this, this spotlight then was doing this like a beam. But once the beam of light hit me, I was paralyzed. And at that moment, that's when I was on the craft. They were about three feet tall. Maybe this high. They, their skin looked like it was made of marshmallow. White, pale color. And they had real big eyes, large, dark eyes. While most abductees speak of being taken by the often described gray alien depicted here, others report insect-like characteristics in some of their captors. There's one being in particular that I always recognize. And he's not a gray. He's taller. He's thinner. He's got a bigger head. He's got bigger eyes. His limbs are very praying mantis-like. There have even been sightings of extraterrestrials that seem to be alien-human hybrids. According to experts, one of the most telling signs of abduction is a gap of hours or days that cannot be accounted for. This missing time aspect is very, very common in abduction experiences where uh, the person cannot remember where he or she was. One possible reason for the lost time, alien testing. With uncanny similarity, nearly all report being subjected to insidious medical experiments. A person will describe being on a table, which is generally metallic. Uh, they uh, are unable to move. They describe operations which take place. The next thing I remember, they have this thing in front of my eye, like a metal instrument that was kind of like shaped like an L. And stuck it, it went all the way back down to here though in my throat. Abductees point to the scars they retain from their encounters as proof of the experience. Connie Smith thought she had merely dreamed of a violent UFO encounter. I just woke up in the morning and I did have that groggy feeling that, you know, that like I've been up all night yet I got eight hours sleep. And um, I sat down on the couch and I looked down and I had a mark just above my knee and uh, there was no pain to it. You could poke and poke, poke at it and there was no pain. And then I had a little scab in my belly button with a little pinhole puncture mark in the middle. Her suspicions deepened when her daughter reported a similar experience. I mean, she had the same huge bruise, which was not painful to her. And I asked if I could see her belly button and I checked and she had the same thing as I did. Jesse Long says he has been abducted repeatedly since his first close encounter at the age of four. After being subjected to a battery of experiments, he was returned home with a similar telltale scar. My mother remembers me uh, pointing out that I had a scar on my leg. Um, she said it never bled. Under the skin, Jesse detected a solid object. It was in my leg for 34 years and I finally decided to have it removed. And this is what they took out. Tests on the object determined its composition to be silicone and trace metals. Jesse believes it is a tracking device. Brian Kosky also says he is the victim of multiple abductions. There's this big black triangle, just moving real slow across the sky and kind of followed over, watched it. It got to about here, kind of stopped, pivoted a little bit, made a hissing sound, and then kind of continued on to the north real slow and just kept watching it. He says that he was permitted to move about the ship. They have these little silver panels that uh, they 
tend to control a ship with their uh, mind. This is the tale they seem to do their navigation from. Are these accounts merely fantasies? Or are they evidence of a staggering development which will alter the course of mankind? Coming up on Unexplained Mysteries, do these twins share an experience so frightening that it proves they have been taken by aliens? The next thing I remembered was they turned me over and then they were doing some type of anal exam. And can their story pass the lie detector test? There's absolutely, positively no doubt in my mind that they are being absolutely honest with me. And later, are UFOs snatching humans as part of a chilling plan that could alter our future? I felt as if somebody had taken my insides and just ripped me open inside, and I could feel something pulling out of me. Could alien crossbreeding be behind these close encounters? I had a, a very vivid experience of having a fetus put into my body and removed. Or are there other earthly explanations? It comes from fairy tales, old science fiction, film, a lot of sources. And we'll give you our final analysis with our Onyx Report. Stay tuned for more on Unexplained Mysteries. Unexplained Mysteries Taken, the Abduction Phenomena. One individual story about being taken may be hard to believe. But what about mass abductions? Groups of people all seized at once, recalling the same chilling event. Something coming towards us. I don't know what it's going to do. Uh, it makes me feel like I'm flying apart. Maine's Allagash River is the site of an encounter that forever altered the lives of four men. Well, we were just a couple of guys camping, fishing, and we were excited about getting out of the city and being in the wilderness. Art students Charlie False, Chuck Rack, and twins Jim and Jack Weiner were looking for a break from the city when they set out for the backwoods of Maine. The last thing on our minds was any UFOs or anything like that. We just wanted to go fishing. It was very, very dark. So we decided to build a fire so we could find our way back to our campsite. And all four of us climbed in one canoe with our fishing equipment and headed out into the lake. Uh, we were out there for approximately 15 or 20 minutes fishing with no luck. <laughs> and um, suddenly Chuck Rack said, hey guys, that's a heck of a case of swamp gas. And we turned around and of probably 150, maybe 200 yards away at the most, coming out of the trees was this huge ball of glowing, pulsating light. Uh, I remember it as being a very bright, round sphere of light that had kind of a uh, roiling quality to it. It was yellow white in nature. The next thing I remembered was seeing the beam coming right towards the back of the canoe. And at that point, we started paddling very quickly towards the shore. And it kept just following us, coming closer and closer and closer. I was in a panic, to be honest with you. A second later, it was right, right on, almost on top of us, with this beam coming across the water right towards our canoe. And I remember thinking, well, we're not going to outrun this thing. There's no way we're going to outrun this thing. And then the next thing I remembered was standing on the beach. Back at their campsite, the roaring fire had burnt down to embers. A lapse time we thought was 15 or 20 minutes, tops. And we couldn't understand why the fire had burnt down so soon. None of the men could account for the missing time, nor were they ready to discuss what had just occurred. The four of us were just left there standing on the beach uh, in total silence. We, we didn't really even talk to each other. I guess we were in shock. Little mention was made of the incident for 12 years until strange dreams began to torment the wieners. 
And then I would wake up and I would be drenched in sweat and my heart would be beating really fast. I started having nightmares about being in some room or some area with uh, these strange creatures around and us. I said, I can't believe you're telling me this because I've been having the same dream. A psychiatrist evaluated the twins and referred them to UFO researcher, Dr. Ray Fowler. Only after agreeing to hypnosis did the brothers begin to recall their shared experience. Here are actual recordings of the session in which all four men from the expedition relive their experience. A beam is coming towards us. I don't know what it's gonna do. Oh, it makes me feel like I'm flying apart. Each of their individual accounts depicted the same harrowing details. Had no idea where I was. Then I realized that the three guys were sitting to my left on this bench naked. All I knew was I was in a strange place, laying naked, paralyzed with this thing coming towards me. I remember um, these creatures examining my brother with a, a type of wand. The next thing I remembered was they turned me over and then they were doing some type of anal exam. I remembered um, the pressure, uh, the heat of uh, my physical body being ripped to shreds, like on a molecular level. I mean, it's the only way I can verbalize it, but it is an extremely unpleasant feeling. It feels like death. I think that the Wieners opened Pandora's box because now they have questions about reality that they never had before. They have questions for which there are no answers. To eliminate the possibility of a hoax, Ray Fowler arranged for a polygraph test to be administered. After administering the examinations, there is absolutely, positively, no doubt in my mind that they are being absolutely honest with me when they tell me that they were confronted by a phenomena in the Allagash region. One person might fool a polygraph examiner. You have four uh, all uh, passing the tests and the polygraph examiner being convinced that all four are telling the truth is uh, very important. I, I feel very strongly that uh, what they uh, describe is a real experience. But to these men, the trip up the Allagash was only the start of an ongoing journey. It's not over. This is an ongoing thing. We're, we're basically, we're tagged. Well, what can I do? Go hide? They're gonna find you. Next stop, if extraterrestrials are abducting humans, what is their alien agenda? <laughs> that is a woman crying out in emotional pain that her child is being taken from her. Are these events tied to the essence of human biology? Sometimes we'd be abducted and there would be sexual situations that would pair off. They've lost their own reproductive capabilities, so they are trying to find a new genetic stock uh, with us. And later, Hollywood's take on aliens. Close encounters, for good or evil, had an enormous effect on uh, what people expected aliens to look like. We'll put it all in perspective in our exclusive On X Report. Coming up on Unexplained Mysteries. Explained Mysteries, Taken, the Abduction Phenomenon. For those who have been taken, the question is not if abductions occur, but why. Indianapolis, Indiana, Debbie Jordan and her mother Janet White noticed a glowing beam of light radiating from their backyard. As I looked out the window, I seen a, a light it was about the size of a basketball. A really strange light coming out of the pump house that's next to the swimming pool out back. Debbie armed herself with a shotgun and ventured toward the light. And Debbie went out in the back, and I watched her out the back door, and she came to the pump house, and she opened the door. All of a sudden, I feel like my whole body is on fire. Every inch of my skin is burning. And I realized I couldn't move. And I also could hardly see. It was like I'd been attacked by a mob of 
tourists with cameras flashing me in the eyes. Neither woman could immediately recall what happened next. Later we figured out I was gone in like an hour and a half, and I don't remember like 10 minutes. Debbie immediately came down with a mysterious disease, and the family dog that lived in the backyard succumbed to what was suspected radiation sickness. These clues and the neighbor's identical account of the blinding light drew the attention of UFO researcher Bud Hopkins. There was more evidence supporting this uh, abduction than any in so far investigated. Hopkins first studied the ground where the incident took place. This is what happened to that nice, rich, loamy, uh, black-brown soil that uh, the backyard in Indiana had. It was turned sort of gray and, and hard as a rock. Hopkins persuaded Debbie to submit to hypnotherapy. Something's not right. I thought I was being squashed. Squashed? The whole body? My stomach. Under hypnosis, an alarming discovery. Debbie Jordan had been pregnant at the time of the incident, but lost the baby. I felt as if somebody had taken my insides and just ripped me open inside, and I could feel pulling, something pulling out of me, and this little tiny thing that looked like a, a, a mouse with no skin on it. This is the first case that let us understand the alien's purpose. Hopkins' theory that alien abduction phenomenon is related to a need to genetically manipulate the human species. <laughs> that is a woman crying out in pain, emotional pain, that her child is being taken from her. Through hypnosis, Debbie recalled witnessing a human-like child during her encounter. She had tufts of white cottony hair sticking out of her head all over, really large eyes, but human, blue. When I thought, oh, I'd love to hug you, I asked if I could take her home with me. And he told me, no, she could survive with me. I assumed they were telling me that I was this child's mother. Debbie says her abductions continued for years afterward, halting only after her hysterectomy. But now, her legacy of abduction has been passed to her two children. I don't expect people to believe any of the stuff that me or any of my family members tell them. Believe me, if I hadn't seen some of this stuff with my own eyes, there's no way I would have believed any of it. Next, is an alien sexual agenda behind the abduction phenomenon? It could be other people's wives, other people's husbands. I've experienced certain things like that. I was with an alien um, that wasn't totally at will. It's hard to explain. Hear one woman's account of carrying an alien baby. I had a, a very vivid experience of having a fetus put into my body and removed. It's ridiculously hard for me to talk about. And later, Hollywood's controversial role in producing the abduction phenomenon. Close encounters, for good or evil, had a enormous effect on uh, what people expected aliens to look like. And you'll see the ultimate roundup of the facts, our Unex report, coming up on Unexplained Mysteries. Mysteries taken the abduction phenomenon. They are close encounters of the most intimate variety. As reports of abductions continue to rise, so too does another alarming trend. The aggressive sexual nature of many recent abductions. Saugerties, New York. James LaFonte and Friends.
began seeking refuge from the city on regular weekend trips to the woodlands of the upstate region. I first met James in 87, and uh, a few friends of us, we all went upstate to uh, the trailer. Just have a nice weekend and enjoy ourselves and have fun. Going up weekly almost became an addiction. Um, it was for enjoyment, but it was almost like we were being called back. As with many abduction reports, the first sign of an unusual occurrence was the shared sense of lost time. James LaFonte contacted me because of certain fragmented memories. He had been with a group of friends, and uh, they knew something had happened. There was a time lapse. Hopkins uncovered a common trait among the group, memories of alien contact in childhood. Ever since I was a child, I used to wake up and I used to see uh, white light and shadowy figures moving around my bed, and I would get scared. When I was younger, I remember like an alien looking through the window, being watched, a feeling of being watched all the time. Through hypnotherapy, Hopkins yielded shared traumatic memories. It turns out week by week, we were all being abducted as a group. It's like on a table. They have their eyes and the skin looks molded. I gotta get out of here. But the detail and scope of these repressed memories exposed an incident of group abduction beyond any on record. I remember seeing these bright lights in almost in every window and there's domes on top of the trailer and um, everything was blowing and we just become basically paralyzed. During the abduction, uh, we would walk down this dark, dark road in a trance state. And we'd be walking to uh, the craft, which was always in the same spot in this uh, pit area. The Saugerties group recalled forced medical tests and there seemed to be a disturbing focus to the experiments. Something was being worked on my genitals. Um, I would see James across the room, and the same thing being done to him. Um, I do know a sperm was removed. To some experts, the group's accounts expose an alien agenda of harvesting human genetic material. There's a very great interest on the part of the UFO occupants in human reproduction, sperm, ova, the DNA, but it has also included an interest in human sexuality itself. Sometimes we'd be abducted and there would be sexual situations that would pair off. It could be other people's wives, other people's husbands, uh, different friends that they were with. According to LaFonte, the experimental pairings could also include alien participants. I've experienced certain things like that. I was with an alien um, that wasn't totally at will. It's hard to explain. To further cope with their trauma, Members of the group sought counseling with a clinical psychologist. Generally, uh, when I work with people using their imagination, there's a, a personalized stamp that people put into their imagery because it's being generated from a part of themselves. These abductees uh, and their reports do not have this kind of personalized stamp, and I think it makes it even more credible. I lost plenty of jobs. I lost friends. I lost family. I lost a number of things. And uh, it got to the point where I would, um, you know, I, I was contemplating suicide in a sense because there was no escape. Is the disturbing account of the Saugerties group a hint as to why aliens are seeking out humankind? If so, many believe that Kim Carlsberg represents the next piece of the puzzle. Kim Carlsberg was a successful professional photographer when an encounter experience changed the direction of her life. I came home, went to bed, I woke up, and I was not in my bed any longer. I was standing in what I thought was an elevator. I was paralyzed. Like so many prior abductee accounts, Kim recalls medical experiments happening around her. And there were these little um, short, off-white beings, naked guys with uh, big black eyes um, doing things to these people on these tables. And I didn't know if I was going to live through the night. I really thought that these people might be dead and I thought that I was going to be next. So I started screaming and uh, a taller alien that looked just like these guys 
uh, walked up behind me and slapped me on the back of the neck, and I started to pass out. Um, next thing I knew, I woke up. I was in a smaller room by myself on a table, and, uh, you know, I'm completely disoriented. I, I don't know where I am. I, I don't know what's happened to me. In a series of semi-lucid flashes, Kim recalls the alien testing. I had an experience where they uh, put a metal rod to my tailbone and they take skin samples. Um, I had something shoved up my nose. I felt this drug feeling come over my body and I knew that I was going to be unconscious within a matter of seconds and there wasn't anything that I could do about it. And I woke up back in my bed and at that point, um, you know, I was just, I thought that I was, had completely lost my mind. I knew I wasn't hallucinating, but it was the only logical explanation. And that encounter was not an isolated episode. She has had numerous subsequent abductions. One memory is particularly harrowing. I had a, a very vivid experience of having <clears throat> having a, uh, a fetus put into my body and removed. It's ridiculously hard for me to talk about. Is Kim's experience corroborating evidence to others' accounts of baby harvesting? If so, why would an advanced race need human babies? One theory holds that alien evolution may have stalled, requiring human DNA for future development. Some people hypothesize that their uh, planet or where they come from is, is arid and barren and they've lost their own reproductive capabilities, so they are trying to find a new genetic stock uh, with us. They do need our genes to um, propagate their own species. It's a recurring theme that we hear from a lot of abductees uh, they're studying us, they're studying our sexuality, our emotions, and they're using us for some uh, design goal as uh, the center of this experiment. Kim's story has been met with fierce skepticism. I know how crazy it sounds for a woman to say she's been implanted with an alien fetus. I'm an intelligent woman, I'm highly educated, I know how the world perceives it, but I'm sorry, it's the truth. To Kim and all abductees, the need for more research into the abduction phenomenon is urgent. Such study could either prove the reality of their claims or provide alternate answers for these troubling encounters. An extraordinary phenomenon such as this demands an extraordinary investigation. It is irresponsible to dismiss it. Next on Unexplained Mysteries, are these alien encounters influenced by popular culture? The more people know about what aliens are expected to look like, the more they're likely to describe an alien as looking like that preconceived idea. Or is Hollywood merely mirroring actual incidents? I think what was unique about Close Encounters is it was science fiction, and yet in a sense it wasn't. They can't tell the difference between whether it was a memory or a real event, or whether it was imagination. This is the problem. And finally, we'll analyze the evidence in our Onyx Report on Unexplained Mysteries. Unexplained Mysteries. Taken. The abduction phenomenon. With reported sightings and alien encounters growing each year, so too have the skeptical inquiries from non-believers. Notable among this group are a number of prominent psychologists who claim that the real root of the UFO phenomenon lies deep in the unconscious mind. It's what we call waking dreams. When people start to fall asleep, on many occasions, they, are, they have a mix, a peculiar mixture of uh, reality and fantasy or dreams and uh, in this particular state of consciousness uh, which is an altered state they see little aliens and they see spaceships and lights in the sky and so on but others defend the technique for abductees in this fragile state they appear to have been overwhelmed by an episode outside their own control and making which leads them in a post-traumatic state it is this very condition that makes them vulnerable to suggestion. They can't tell the difference between 
whether it was a memory or a real event or whether it was imagination. And this is the problem. That's very interesting. Either there's something very special about this fantasy that causes what otherwise does not occur, or it's not a fantasy. Others point out that abductions were scarcely reported before the science fiction boom of the mid-1950s carried visions of aliens into popular culture. This is a composite of what they look like. Larger eyes, smaller nose, no lips, no protruding part of the ear, no hair, and uh, a gray tone to the skin. A New Hampshire couple, Betty and Barney Hill, made news by becoming the first to claim that they had been abducted by aliens. UFO experts point to the Hill abduction as a watershed event in alien evolution. But to author James Oberg, the case is notable for more earthly reasons. A lot of Betty's memories are directly traceable back to a movie called Invaders from Mars. Many of the themes, many of the imageries from that film appear in almost recognizable form in Betty's story. In the account, there was kidnapping being taken on board a flying saucer. There were needles being inserted into people's brains or other parts of their bodies. Barney Hill's recollections focused on one major feature. The unique feature here is, is these wrapped around eyes, the eyeballs that move off to the forehead, off to the side of the head. It was, a, it was very original, and yet less than two weeks after this face first appeared on television, Barney Hill, under hypnosis, suddenly remembered that his aliens had eyes like that, had eyes that wrapped around. Was it cause and effect? Did he see the show? Was his memory polluted by this Hollywood version? Can't prove it, but the sequence is highly suggestive. By the early 1970s, Hollywood seemed to settle on an accepted standard for what an alien looked like. According to skeptics, this design trend was again echoed in the description by alleged abductees. The thing you'll never forget when you look into the face of these things is the eyes. Very large, intimidating black eyes. Very small opening for a mouth, no ears. Tremendous head, um, very thin body, uh, long arms. Yet, science fiction archivist Ron Miller traces images back much further. It comes from fairy tales, old science fiction, film, a lot of sources. They go back decades, even a century or more. And the earliest sort of realistic depictions of an alien I have from a book that was published in 1884. Ninety years later, a Steven Spielberg film about alien contact cemented the image. Did close encounters of the third kind also plant suggestions in the minds of future abductees? Close encounters, for good or evil, had an enormous effect on uh, what people expected aliens to look like. And if anything really focused all these disparate threads into one sort of standard alien, it was close encounters. But Joe Elvis, the production designer for Close Encounters claims that logic is reversed. I think what was unique ab about Close Encounters is it was science fiction, and yet in a sense it wasn't because we weren't manufacturing something f that was convenient. We took these things from all the encounters that we could record and sort of put it into the funnel and it came out with these kind of images. Kelly Freeze a celebrated science fiction illustrator is disappointed by the dominance of the gray, both in pop culture and in the reports of abductees. I hate to think that the universe is, is so dull that that's the best it could come up with. Are we supposed to assume that only one race uh, managed to uh, accomplish space flight and come to the Earth? Or are there more, more races out there? If so, what do the other races look like? When we come back, the Unex Report examines the facts and addresses the mysteries. 
What can we learn from all of these abductees reporting nearly identical encounters? And do aliens really have an agenda for mankind? Or is extraterrestrial contact the product of our collective imagination? That's the Unex Report, next on Unexplained Mysteries. Unexplained Mysteries, taken, the abduction phenomenon. Now, our Unex Report. The past 40 years have seen a surge in reports of man being taken by aliens. Experts point to a number of signs as evidence of abduction, such as missing time. This missing time aspect is very, very common in abduction experiences, where uh, the person cannot remember where he or she was. Other indications include strange medical symptoms and even implants. It was in my leg for 34 years and I finally decided to have it removed. And this is what they took out. The use of hypnosis is increasingly being used to access hidden memories of alien encounters. And there were these little um, short off-white beans, naked guys with uh, big black eyes doing things to these people on these tables. I felt as if somebody had taken my insides and just ripped me open inside. Over and over again, we get these hidden consistencies in uh, abduction reports which come out through hypnosis. And there are striking similarities in the descriptions of the aliens. Very large, intimidating black eyes. Very small opening for a mouth, no ears. Tremendous head, um, very thin body, uh, long arms. Many encounters now seem to reveal that an alien breeding agenda may be behind many abductions. There's a very great interest on the part of the UFO occupants in human reproduction. They do need our genes to um, propagate their own species. I had a, a very vivid experience of having... <clears throat> having... A, uh, a fetus put into my body and removed. Among the most compelling cases are mass abductions. Subjects are taken together and recall the same experience. During the abduction, uh, we would walk down this dark, dark road in a trance state. I remember um, these creatures examining my brother with a, a type of wand. Polygraph machines have further verified their accounts. There's absolutely, positively, no doubt in my mind that they are being absolutely honest with me. But skeptics maintain that Hollywood is the real source of all alien sightings. More people know about what aliens are expected to look like, the more they're likely to describe an alien as looking like that preconceived idea. One thing is certain. The complex reality of abduction will continue to spur debate as long as so many questions remain unanswered. It is irresponsible to dismiss it. An extraordinary phenomenon such as this demands an extraordinary investigation. Until that time, the alien abduction phenomenon will remain an unexplained mystery. day the inhabitants of planet earth have looked to the stars for proof of other life but the truth isn't out there it's in here since world war ii the british government has been watching us 
watching the skies. Buried in the vaults of the Ministry of Defense are thousands of reports on UFO sightings, some left unexplained. But now, after decades of secrecy, the files are being released. And for the first time, the truth about Britain's UFOs is revealed. A near mid-air collision. I can't speculate on what it was, I really can't. I mean, I don't know to this day what it was. The World War II bomber's close encounter. I don't talk about it too much to people, only, only close friends. An unidentified object caught on radar. And new evidence on one of the most celebrated UFO cases, the Welsh Roswell. If it could be shown that any UFOs were extraterrestrial in origin, people's entire belief system would fundamentally change. Strange, unexplained stories that leave many wondering if there really is life out there. What are three popular word searches on the internet? Perhaps the first two are no surprise. UFOs have an incredible hold on the popular imagination, but few myths have involved government investigations, surveillance and cover-ups. UFOs have. One person who knows just how seriously UFO sightings have been taken by the British authorities is ex-MOD operative Nick Pope. From 1952 onwards, it was decided that there really needed to be a, a small unit set up permanently to research and investigate the UFO phenomenon. And really from the 50s right up until 2009, the Ministry of Defence uh, did have a small project looking at the UFO mystery. Pope and the UFO desk in the 90s, helping add to the thousands of files the Ministry had gathered for decades. Now that they're being released from the vaults, key UFO eyewitnesses give their side of the stories. And UFO experts, skeptics and believers interrogate just what the MOD was keeping secret. Dr. David Clark is the journalist who helped first persuade the MOD to release the files. If you look in the files, there are thousands of unusual things in the sky from right across the British Isles. There's absolutely no doubt that people see things in the sky that they can't identify. They always have done. Sixth of January, 1995. Two experienced pilots of a Boeing 737 carrying 60 passengers from Milan to Manchester report a near collision. It's an incredible sighting of an unidentified flying object which sends the authorities into a spin. In the defense files, there are, there are quite a number of incidents uh, involving uh, near misses between um, civil aircraft and unidentified flying objects. The most impressive um, of all was a report that was made um, by the crew of a, a British Airways 737. Speedbird 5061, overhead penines, nine miles. They were just about to enter this cloud bank, quite a clear sky, good sort of vision. Suddenly the first officer said he saw this object coming towards him uh, like an illuminated Christmas tree. so low in its approach and so close that he, auto he automatically ducked thinking there was going to be a collision. And this thing just zoomed past and immediately he turned to the captain and said, did you see that? The captain said, yeah, I saw it as well. Immediately the pilots radioed into Manchester control tower. There's a lot of, um, of concern amongst air crews about what damage could be done to the reputation if they became known as, you know, the crew that see flying saucers. So it was interesting in this case that despite that, these two air crew decided that when they landed they were going to file an official air miss. Uh, report so that would then trigger a full um, detailed investigation by the Civil Aviation Authority which is exactly what happened. For the first time the MOD files show how this extraordinary incident sparked a full-scale investigation conducted by aircraft near-miss investigator Anthony Booth. Well it was unusual for a start because it was the only one in my memory in, in seven years of working in, in that particular department that I'd actually dealt with something like this. We could talk to the pilots, both the pilots, we would go through looking at radar recordings, radio tra uh, RT transcript recordings of the voices of the pilots, the recordings of what Manchester Air Traffic Control had to say. We just looked at anything that might sh shed some light on what this object might have been. The pilots now refuse to talk publicly about the near crash, but the MOD files recall what they told Anthony Booth at the time. My attention was initially focused on the glare shield in front of me, but I was diverted by something in my peripheral vision. 
The object had a number of small white lights, rather like a Christmas tree. The high speed of the object, although unable to estimate its distance, it was very close. There's a transcript of the conversation between the captain of the 737 and ground control. So this is speedbird 5061. We just let something go down the right hand side, just above us, very fast. And Manchester immediately come back and say, well, there's nothing seen on radar. Was it an aircraft? Well, it had lights. You went down the starboard side very quickly. Manchester say, and just above you? Uh, just slightly above us, yes. Manchester then advise them to keep an eye out for anything, but they can't see anything at all. Um, it must have been very fast. It down very quickly after it passed you, I think. OK, well, there you go. The Manchester control tower could not find any radar signal. To radar expert Doug Robb, this is extraordinary. And it says the likelihood of such activity escaping detection is remote, as the area is well served by several radars, and any movement at the levels in question would almost certainly have generated a radar response. Nothing was seen. So what was it that avoided radar detection? The MOD files show that the investigators and pilots considered all the possibilities. Give it a hang glider. Right, it's suicidal. Hang, hang glider would not be picked up uh, by normal radar, no. Come in. Ah, I think so. A meteor could be detected on re-entry if the radar was looking exactly in the right direction uh, as that piece of... Uh, debris went past at some speed. Military? Oh, maybe, but I didn't recognise it. But we're near a major airport. It would have shown up on the radar response. A spy plane? I don't think so. It didn't look like a stealth. Stealth aircraft uh, would not be picked up by normal radars. If a spy plane is being kept secret, it's not going to be flying where people can see it. And certainly nowhere near uh, airliners. UFO? <laughs> Daft. I don't know. These pilots are not lying. They did have an unusual experience, which to them remains baffling. The files show the investigation seriously analyzed the possibility of military activity, but they found no evidence from any official source. It seems most unlikely that such a flight would have been conducted so close to a busy international airport. So what was it? We revealed the conclusion, locked away in the MOD vault since 1995, reached by Anthony Booth's investigation. Most of the incidents that we looked at, we could arrive at some conclusion, definite conclusion. But in this case, we couldn't really. We had to come up with an assessment of cause and risk. Both the risk and the cause were unassessable. Degree of risk, unassessable. Cause, unassessable. Really, that statement is, is, is really, really unusual to find that in an official air miss report. And it's basically saying we don't have a clue what was seen. What they'll say back at BA. I think they might rib us about this one. At the end of their, um, the summary of the working group's discussions, it says that there is no doubt that these pilots both saw an object and that it was of sufficient significance to prompt an air miss report. Unfortunately, the nature and identity of this object remains unknown. To speculate about extraterrestrial activity, fascinating though it may be, is not within the group's remit and must be left to those whose interest lies in this field. To some UFOlogists like Nick Pope, the absence of any real conclusion leaves serious and unanswered questions. Now, to me, this was quite extraordinary. UFO does not mean alien spacecraft, but clearly, in some people's minds, whether it was the pilot and the first officer, or whether it was the investigators at the Civil Aviation Authority or the Ministry of Defence, clearly somebody was thinking, well, maybe, just maybe, this is something extraterrestrial. I can't speculate on what it was. I really can't. I mean, I don't know to this day what it was. Um, all I know is that we, you know, we can't assume we know everything in this day and age. Um, there may be things that we don't know about. The Manchester near-miss investigation shows just how seriously unexplained sightings were taken by the MOD. But the UFO desk had been receiving reports from pilots for decades. The files reveal sightings during World War II, and in some cases, these were considered so grave, they were referred right to the top of government. The newly released UFO files confirm what many experts suspected. The British government was investigating unexplained sightings as far back as World War II. I don't talk about it too much to people, only, only close friends who experienced um, perhaps um, flying during the war. Spring 1944. Britain was engaged in heavy bombing raids over Germany. Rumours of strange, unidentified missiles were getting through to top command. Considered a threat to public morale, the MOD files reveal that the order to keep them secret came right from the top. Sightings such as the one seen by gunner Bernard Dye. Now I have here a 
personal wartime diary. I'll read you an entry which I wrote on the 26th of April. Operation Essen. 300 aircraft raided Essen. Die then recorded the most extraordinary sight. By unidentified objects, which I describe as just red balls of fire. This is the first time Bernard Dye has spoken on television about what happened that night. We left the target area and we were heading back towards Mildenhall, our base. We were heading across France. Everything appeared to be peaceful. Suddenly I saw three balls of fire coming up from below and reported this to our pilot. Arthur Horton on the intercom. A few seconds afterwards, the rear gunner, Brian Harper, he observed two more red balls of fire. Immediately, Arthur was a bit perturbed, and were they fighters? No, not fighters, Arthur, just balls of fire coming towards us. We said to Arthur, now, evasive action, corkscrew, starboard, go, go, go. We traveled over 300 miles per hour. The aircraft was shaking like a leaf, and still they were following. The pilot was getting worried about burning the engines up. Uh, engineer, Dave, what about the engines? Never mind the engines, Skipper. Keep going, or something to that effect. The words were rather rude. It certainly gave me and the crew the willies to see them. After a short distance, these five red objects, they just got slower and they just the red lights disappeared into the blackness below and um, we got safely home well when we got back to uh, Milden all our base you know each crew is interrogated by intelligence officers and they just laughed at us and this upset the pilot and um, you know he said you wouldn't bloody well have been laughing if you'd have been sitting with us in the aircraft what did gunner Bernard die think they were didn't know what to think, but I, I, I thought they were just a, a new weapon that the Germans had invented. Bernard Dai was not alone. Other World War II aircrew had also reported unexplained sightings. And we now know that at least one of these reports was suppressed, and the order to do so came right from the top. Wartime Prime Minister Winston Churchill was so terrified the report would leak out, he ordered a 50-year blackout. Mr. Churchill declared that the UFO incident should be immediately classified for at least 50 years and its status reviewed by a future Prime Minister. Churchill's order referred specifically to a late World War II sighting made by a British air crew returning from a reconnaissance mission over Germany. The files record... My grandfather was present during a debate about an unexpected incident experienced by an RAF bomber crew. The MOD files show that the story originates from the grandson of Churchill's bodyguard, who had been present at an urgent meeting between the Prime Minister and the US commander of the Allied forces, General Eisenhower, who discussed the incident together. He um, was writing in to see if the Ministry could confirm this story, that this guy who was the bodyguard was present at a, a discussion between uh, Winston Churchill and Eisenhower about a, a mysterious incident when the crew of a, a Royal Air Force reconnaissance aircraft had seen this, um, this metallic object that had appeared by the side of, the, of their aircraft and it, 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 it followed the aircraft and it behaved in a, in a, in a way that was completely uh, unexplainable in terms of it being you know, a, a German aircraft or any other sort of a Nazi um, um, flying machine that they were aware of. A leading aircraft expert was also at the meeting. He dismissed any possibility that it could be a missile, since a missile could not suddenly match its speed with a slower aircraft and then accelerate again. Churchill was determined this would go no further. Another person at the meeting raised the possibility of an unidentified flying object, at which point Mr. Churchill declared that the incident should be immediately classified. But the file goes further. One extraordinary line explains just how fearful Churchill was of public reaction to this UFO sighting, if it ever got out. This event should be immediately classified since it would create mass panic amongst the general population and destroy one's belief in the church. But the files also reveal that this wasn't the first time Churchill had got embroiled in UFO sightings. 
In October 1912, um, there was um, sightings of uh, mysterious lights in the sky um, over the, um, the dockyards at Sheerness in Essex. Winston Churchill was the first Lord of the Admiralty and he, he had to uh, look into this and Churchill had to admit in Parliament that he couldn't explain what had been seen. The files show that even after the war, Churchill took a personal interest in unexplained sightings. In the aftermath of the, of the sightings in Washington, D.C. in 1952, that made all the news headlines, Winston Churchill again became interested and sent the memo to the Secretary of State for Air. What does all this stuff about flying saucers amount to? What can it mean? What is the truth? Let me have a report at your convenience. Until now, Gunnar Bernard Dye never knew there were other World War II sightings that Churchill wanted kept secret at such a critical time in the war. We showed him the newly released MOD file on Churchill. Well, after reading this report, it sounds, you know, really identical to, to what we, uh, we witnessed and saw that night. I haven't heard of this before, but it doesn't surprise me that he was told about it, because things happened during the, uh, the war years, and uh, these, there were other objects obviously appeared. It's interesting that during the 1940s there were a very large number of sightings reported by air crew and uh, there are various Royal Air Force files at the National Archives um, that um, detail some of these reports, rocket phenomena that were described as, but they were never able to explain them. And at the end of the war, when they um, debriefed some of the Luftwaffe pilots, they, was, they said that they'd seen very similar things themselves and they thought they were allied secret weapons. So is there an explanation as to what the air crew saw? Dave Clark has his own theory. They just thought that it was a combination of uh, misperception on, on part of the air crew. They were expecting enemy um, action because they were so charged up on adrenaline. UFO or not, the files show that the World War II leaders were desperate to keep such sightings away from the public. The next file reveals how even decades later, the government was still panicking about UFOs. Many UFO experts believe that the Pitlockery file illustrates one of the most significant UFO conspiracies of recent times. It involves photographs of an unidentified object captured flying over a remote Scottish valley. The photos were sent to the MOD, but mysteriously went missing. Journalist Mark Pilkington has spent years trying to track down these UFO images. The Pitlockery photographs in the MOD files date back to the 4th of August 1990, when two witnesses on the A9 near Calvine, near Pitlockery, allegedly saw a large diamond-shaped craft hovering in the air for about 10 minutes and took six photographs of it. And the object that they claimed to have seen was accompanied by two aircraft, which the MOD later identified as Harriers. The photographer has never been identified. He sent the six photographs to the Scottish Daily Record newspaper. The paper never ran the story. Instead, they referred them to the MOD for investigation. The Ministry of Defence took their own copies of the photographs, which have since disappeared. They, according to the files, sent the original negatives back to the Scottish Daily Record, which inexplicably never ran a story on the subject and never, never published the photographs and presumably returned them to the two men whose names have been removed from the file, so we can't ask the two men. So it mystery piled upon mystery. All that remains in the files is a photocopy of the alleged photographs. UFOlogists later mocked up this photo of what was seen. But Nick Pope dealt with the original photos and file when he worked behind the MOD desk. Both the Defence Intelligence staff and the Joint Air Reconnaissance Intelligence Centre analysed this very carefully, and the consensus was, was clear on this. This was a real object. It was maybe 25, 30 metres in diameter. I sat down with my opposite number from the defense intelligence staff at a briefing about ufos we discussed this photograph extensively this was something that was of defense interest because clearly it could do something that we couldn't and we wanted that technology the mod was determined to play down the incident there's an interesting briefing by the minister of defense press office um, on defensive lines to take if these photographs made it into the newspapers and they were asked questions about this and there's, there's a list that basically says that we have looked at the photographs and no definitive conclusions have been reached regarding the large diamond shaped object and if they were pressed by the media they were told to say all sighting reports received by the ministry are referred to the staff in the departments which are responsible for the air defense of the UK during his time with the ministry Pope had a blown up copy of the photograph on his office wall until it was personally taken down by his superior. One suggestion 
was that this was a secret prototype American spy plane. My head of division convinced himself that this probably was some secret aircraft or drone, and he ordered that this be removed. We know from the files that there was a lot of internal discussion about, you know, were the Americans flying this incredible um, um, spy plane? You know, and if so, why had they not asked for permission, you know, for this thing to fly through British airspace? Journalist Mark Pilkington believes that events at the time could well have influenced what people thought they had seen. This was just uh, two days after the first Gulf War had broken out, and there were certainly great deployments of aircraft uh, towards the Middle East, and the UK was a kind of uh, sort of stop-off point and a, and a sort of launch pad for a lot of those aircraft. The MOD were clearly worried about public reaction, just as Churchill had been four decades earlier. So was there a cover-up by the MOD over the mysterious Pitlochry photographs? There's a possibility that the Ministry of Defence destroyed these images, possibly because they thought that they were some American spy plane that uh, they'd rather uh, we didn't know about, or maybe uh, if, if this thing genuinely remained unexplained because we simply didn't want the embarrassment of saying that there might be things in our airspace with speeds and manoeuvres that exceed everything that we've got and, and yet which remain unexplained. However, all we're basing this on, we should make clear, is a very grainy, fuzzy black and white image that, for all I know, could have been drawn by a child with crayons. Mark Pilkington is still looking for the real Pitlockery photographs to find out just what did put Britain's defences to the test. But six years later, on Britain's east coast, another UFO sighting sparks off a full-scale military investigation and a direct challenge to the Secretary of State for Defence. In 1996, the Ministry of Defence was drawn into a serious breach of UK defences by a UFO over East Anglia. MOD files reveal it not only involved the police, Coast Guard and RAF, but a call to the Defence Secretary to scramble jet fighters. I'm very concerned about an incident that occurred off the East Anglian coast recently involving a visual unidentified flying craft sighting that was correlated by various different military radar systems. Why weren't our jets scrambled? It was one of the biggest UFO scares ever. And it all started one quiet October night on the East Coast. was the police officers actually who phoned in the first reports. There's an extract from that. In the early hours of the morning, the police are saying we can see a red and green rotating light in the sky directly southeast from Skegness. It looks to be high in the sky directly over the wash. Very nice. The patrol officers reported the sighting to the station sergeant. I immediately phoned it through to the Skegness control room, who relayed it onto Great Yarmouth Coast Guard Maritime Rescue, suspecting it might be an incident over the sea. We had a report at about quarter past three local time from uh, Skegness Police, and they could actually see this light in a southeasterly direction. We were uncertain of what it was at the time, and uh, we immediately made a report to the local air defence radars to see if they could see anything. The call went through to RAF Neatis Head, the most important air defence centre in southern England. Clark's radar has a contact bearing at 221 degrees at... They noticed that on one of the radars, a blip that they couldn't um, identify that wasn't an aircraft. Could the mysterious radar blip and the strange lights seen by the police be the same thing? Panic calls from the public started to come in. No, no, I don't think they're invading. The call was put out to shipping to keep a lookout for unidentified lights. Then a tanker came back. The vessel at sea was the uh, Connor Coast, and she was in much this sort of area. At 3.50 a.m., patrol officer PC Leyland rushed onto the police station roof to video the strange lights and managed to capture five minutes of footage now showing a single stationary white light. News of the sighting spread quickly through the UFO grapevine. The transcript of the conversation between the Coast Guard and the, um, the police and the trawler crew got, um, was leaked to the, uh, to the local news and it suddenly became this huge UFO incident that, um, that got to the attention of the local MP. The sighting gathered such momentum, even local Labour MP Martin Redmond got embroiled and started asking difficult questions. Martin Redmond said, look, you've got police officers seeing UFOs, you've got Royal Air Force officers tracking them on radar, and yet you don't even get the aircraft uh, in the air to take a look at this thing. Here's a copy of the letter that uh, Martin Redmond MP sent to uh, the Right Honourable Mike Michael Portillo, Secretary of State for Defence, and he says, I'm very concerned about an incident that occurred off the East Anglian coast recently involving a visual unidentified flying craft sighting 
which was correlated by various different military radar systems. While I'm interested in finding out what was seen, my primary concern stems from the absolute shambles that such an event seemed to cause. So he's really sort of having a go at the Ministry of Defence and saying, you know, why didn't you react to this? What are the, what are the RAF doing? So this really stung the, the RAF. The files reveal a picture of chaos. The letter sparked off an MOD investigation to explain the RAF's resistance. Doug Robb was operations manager on the night. We showed him the MOD findings. He wasn't surprised by the conclusions. This diagram is the radar plots uh, over Boston on that night. And in summary, uh, it shows that Claxby picked up the object, but it didn't move, and it was on land. And after investigation, uh, it was decided that it was uh, the Judge Tower, the Boston stump, as it's known. The files were certain this was the culprit. The church is known in aviation circles as the Boston stump and appears occasionally on some radars in certain radar propagation conditions. They said that this was a completely separate phenomenon to the bright stationary lights that had been seen by the police from Boston and Skegness and by the, um, the tanker crew. The report concluded there was no justification to order the scramble of RAF fighters, much to the chagrin of the local MP, Martin Redmond. You'd scramble for a high-speed incoming aircraft 200 miles away, but you're not going to scramble the aircraft for a fixed object on land. I mean, what's the threat? If what the radar picked up was indeed a church, what then were the mysterious lights seen by the police and the tanker crew? The MOD scrutinized the police video footage. It suggests a distant celestial source. The MOD sent the footage onto the Royal Greenwich Observatory for analysis. Their report has been kept buried since 1996 in the MOD files. UFO and astronomy expert Ian Ridpath was shown their conclusions and the police video. If you look at the police video, you can see it's just a, a bright dot of light just sitting there, not appearing to do anything. So, to me, this shows that even the uh, most impeccable witnesses can actually make what is really a, a basic mistake, which is just misidentifying bright celestial objects. Well, the most common culprit is the planet Venus. In fact, it's called the queen of the UFOs, and this is because it's the brightest object in the night sky after the sun and the moon, which could have been what the police were seeing. He also believes there's an explanation for the colors of the lights. When the camera zooms in, very often the camera will completely lose focus, and, and you can actually see some, some odd shape to the light, um, which is actually the diaphragm of the camera. But this doesn't explain what the tanker crew observed. The MOD investigation found that they saw a light coming from a different direction to Venus. And they were baffled. These lights remain unexplained. But expert Ian Ridpath believes there is an answer. The object that the tanker saw to the north, I think, was another bright star called Vega, which is also just appearing to twinkle and, and flash multicolored lights. UFO expert and skeptic Dave Clark believes there is a reason why this escalated into such a major incident. This happened in 1996, which was the very height of the popularity of the X-Files series on, um, on TV. It was the biggest sort of um, year, the 1996-97, in terms of number of reports they received um, since 1978. So is this case closed for East Anglia? Or will more mystery emerge, just as it has, with one of Britain's most celebrated cases that refuses to go away, the Welsh Roswell? In 1974, in North Wales, thousands of people experienced a violent earth tremor and lights were seen falling from the sky. Some ufologists believe a UFO crashed and there's been a cover-up ever since of the Welsh Roswell. Oh, a heck of a bath, yeah. Oh, yes, it's like a tremor it was in the house, shook the houses, we were in new houses. And it seemed to come right on top of the head and thought the house was coming down. There were lights coming from the top of the mountain, just up over there. 24th of January 1974 at 2150 GMT. Five bodies spectacularly incandescent were observed traversing the sky. New information has been revealed that opens the mystery further. Named as one of the main witnesses in the Bowen incident is Hugh Lloyd, then a 14-year-old farmer's son. Just after 8.30 p.m., Hugh's family felt the massive earth tremor. It was a frightening experience. Almost 40 years on, Hugh still remembers that day as if it were yesterday. What? It was like this thud, and straight away the whole place started shaking very violently. The light flickered in the, tele light on, in the picture on television, snow on the, on the screen. But uh, we, did, you know, we were all frightened, we didn't have a clue what it was. And uh, 
and Oxford down, it must be an explosion. And then the phone started, started ringing. Hello? Like neighbours, you know, phoning to ask, did you feel that? And then roughly about uh, 20 minutes, there was a knock on the door. What's that? What's that? And there was a police officer there. And he said, we've got, had reports there's a plane crash that come down on the Bedouin. And we'd like to commandeer your Land Rover to go up there. Me being 14, I said, well, Enoch, you better drive it. I down up the mountain about half a mile, maybe three quarters. And we drove up the track and uh, we stopped, got out and got uh, torches and it was very quiet and very dark, but you know, nothing to be seen. How are we going with the torch? One of them said, um, there's nothing here, it's too quiet, we can't, we can't see anything, we might as well go down. So we turned back to the vehicles and as we were approaching the vehicles, we saw this very bright white light. Betty, who It's up the valley, just behind those trees there, up to the left in the valley between those two mountains. A very bright white light, you know, from, coming up from the ground, up, you know, pointing upwards. But it was, you know, very, very bright. I knew it was coming from the ground, but we, we couldn't actually see the source of the light because it was, you know, in the valley itself, being hidden. The light didn't look like a plane crash. It was too white for a fire. It didn't last very long, 20 seconds was what at the most. They searched the mountainside, but there was no sign of a crash. So what was the light? Ufologist Andy Roberts has researched the Berwyn UFO for years. Although a skeptic, he admits there is a central mystery to the incident involving another key witness. At a village nearby called Thandervel, um, there was a district nurse called Pat Evans. She felt the explosion there, and because she was a nurse and had all the, uh, the medical equipment, thought, if a plane's crashed, I could get up there and give much-needed help until the emergency services arrived. Pat Evans was with her two teenage daughters, four miles from Hugh Lloyd when the earth tremor hit. So she picked up her two young daughters, got them in the car, drove the 10, 15 minute drive up onto the B4391 road, expecting to see an aircraft crashed and in flames. This is the road that she was driving on, and it's a road that she knew very well, so she had no problems driving up here at night. And obviously she was out there looking for uh, what she thought was going to be a plane disaster. And just as she came out from the other side of this uh, copse of trees, she was absolutely astonished to see, far across the hills to the left, a huge ball of uh, red, white, orange, pulsating light. Whatever the object was, it was too far from the road to be reached on foot. Pat and her daughters watched, astounded at the ball of light, slowly pulsating and changing colour. She described it as being half the size of the moon, and around this object were moving torch lights and vehicle lights. She realised that it clearly wasn't a crashed aircraft and that someone or some people were there attending to whatever it was. And realising that, she drove back home and went to bed, and to this day is completely mystified by what it was. So what did Pat Evans and Hugh Lloyd see that night? We reveal that even the arrival of the mysterious men in black couldn't provide all the answers. The unidentified sightings by Pat Evans and Hugh Lloyd in Berwyn, Wales in 1974 have gone down in UFO folklore. The recently released MOD files have added even more mystery. Researchers from the British Geological Survey were quickly dispatched to Berwyn to investigate an earth tremor that had registered 3.5 on the Richter scale. Immediately after the earthquake, we were getting a lot of reports, uh, some of them rather complex ones about lights in the sky, lights on the hill. So I brought a small team of people down to ask the local people around here what they'd seen, what they'd heard, what they'd felt. The British Geological Survey team have become known in Berwyn legend as the Men in Black, as they were dressed in dark suits, official looking, and were going door to door. Some people seem to think the whole event was rather suspicious, and that we, simple scientists from the Geological Survey, had something to do with suspicious events around here. Files containing Chris's notes recall his interview with nurse Pat Evans, who saw the unidentified light. I have here the notes that I made when I talked to Pat Evans. She felt the shaking, but also she was very concerned about lights that she saw in the sky. She thought there was a, a big red light, like a, a glowing red fire. This is a copy of one of the maps that we, with our team, used uh, when we were going around the area talking to people and uh, we were able, therefore, to put on the map exactly where we got that interview from and, therefore, exactly what that person saw, heard and felt. This British Geological Survey map, buried in the vaults, is a revelation. It shows the anomalous light seen by Pat Evans and Hugh Lloyd both appeared in the same small area of hillside at the same time. UFOlogist Andy Roberts returns to the same spot on the mountainside where Pat and her daughter saw the UFO. 
and where Pat Evans told her story to Andy Roberts in 1998. When I brought uh, Pat Evans up onto this mountain road in 1998 and she told me her story then, she, I photographed her and the photograph that um, I took showed her pointing to where she saw what she saw in 1974 and judging by this photograph she was pointing over there and which we know is where the police and the farmers were searching that night. Pat Evans was on the Shanganuk to Walshport Road which is just, well there, just, just beyond the forestry there. So if she was there, she, she properly saw the same lights as we saw. You know, because she's dead in line. I'm sure I'm nearly positive that's the same light she's on. The recent files show the MOD's explanation for the sudden explosion and mysterious lights. Subsequent search of the hillsides in question revealed no sign of impact, however. The meteorological office considered that these sightings could have been occasioned by a bolide, that is to say, a meteor which enters the Earth's atmosphere and burns up before reaching the ground. A private investigation done on behalf of the British Astronomical Society concluded, however, that the meteor may in fact have disintegrated over Manchester and that its appearance was preceded at 8.30 p.m. by an earth tremor in the Berwyn Mountains with which it has no connection. So they were saying again, these are two things that happened coincidentally on the same night, you've got a meteor burning up in the atmosphere and also you've got an earth tremor. So is this incredible coincidence, two separate natural phenomena, a meteor shower and an earthquake happening simultaneously, in itself a complete answer to the mystery? Many UFO believers think not. They believe the files failed to answer the big question, what was the source of light Pat Evans and Hugh Lloyd saw on the ground? So what Pat saw is an absolute mystery. I don't think it's a UFO for a minute, although it is an unidentified something. It appeared to be on the ground. If anything, it's an unidentified grounded object. Um, but it's a mystery. So in and amongst all the, the hype about aliens and extraterrestrial crashing, in amongst the truth and the fact about earthquake and bolide meteors, what we have is a mysterious sighting of a stationary, large, glowing object on the ground for at least 10 minutes. So is this case closed for Berwyn? There are still many unanswered questions. The Booming Mountain incident is, I, I think in many people's minds, it's not case closed. Some people believe that the release of these files is itself uh, disinformation and that the Ministry of Defence is still covering up some great secret truth about UFOs. The MOD has agreed to release all the UFO files over time. But will all the secrets be revealed? It seems that the public is not ready to give up believing just yet. For some people, UFOs are with us for a long time to come. Well, until the real ones show up. Some people suggest that this drip feeding of information to the public about UFOs is 